God is good. Amen. I praise the Lord for every Sabbath, no matter where I am. I just love the day of rest. And uh, it's so important to take that time to reflect with Jesus and uh, to think he gave us a whole day. What a Lord we serve. Amen. Bow your heads with me, please, as we begin in prayer. Gracious, loving Father, we give you our hearts today. We thank you, Lord, for taking us into your loving arms, giving us your knowledge and your wisdom. Lord, let us not waste the opportunities you've given us. Let us not look back and think of what we could have done for the Lord. So, Lord, today we give you this day and every day forward. Bless us now, make us strong, that we may minister to those in the St. Charles and surrounding areas. Bless us now, Lord, in Jesus' name. I grew up in a, uh, a wonderful neighborhood. Uh, I had lots of friends. I think there were uh, 22 kids around our age, and uh, we really... Uh, became close friends. We did all kinds of things together. We had uh, corn roasts and 4th of July parties. And we just, we bonded together as a family in this neighborhood. And uh, no matter what the situation was, I grew up where alcohol had a very regular use in my life, whether it was with the neighborhood, family events, hunting, fishing, it was always there. I just considered it part of life and didn't really know the downsides of it. But many occasions I was uh, offered to partake of the bottle that was being passed around by the adults, even as young kids we were. And I remember hating every time because it just burned my throat. And this terrible drink, this horrendous flavor that made you shiver every time you swallowed it, I didn't quite understand it, but everybody did it. So we kind of went along, my brothers and I. Now, <clears throat> I was on a fishing trip one time <clears throat> out in the ice, ice fishing with my uncle, and we were getting cold. He says, well, here, have some of this. And he handed us a bottle of whatever it was and said, it'll warm you up. So, of course, we drank it, and there was that, just that horrible flavor that curled your face up when you swallowed it, and it warmed me up all right and burned my throat all the way down. Not the kind of heat I was looking for, but this was my uncle's solution at the time, and uh, it's just plain awful stuff. It's so awful that our taste buds and our smell recognize this is poison. The Lord put it in us to recognize when we're not supposed to ingest something, right? And when something like alcohol is ingested, it tastes bad. Our body knows it, right? Now, if it's rotten food, we're not going to eat it, right? Rotten eggs, rotten fish. Like, think about rotting food. We throw it right in the garbage can. But some people believe that there is value in consuming this drink. Um, the only way they can really do it, though, is to become really tough people and say, I just bear through it and it doesn't bother me, and they can just drink it straight. But most people, most people try and soften the flavor with a mix. They try and add in juice or cream or their favorite soda because they have to do something to cut that flavor because it's that bad. So the mixed drink is the most popular way to consume alcohol. It simply covers up the poisonous flavor, making it hard for your body to detect what you're actually drinking. It's a deception. We mix in something good like orange juice with something bad so we can ingest something that we know is not good for us. And of course, once consumed, the effects are obvious, right? People become lightheaded. Their ambitions in the mind inhibitions put there by God to keep us from making bad decisions start to get relaxed, right? People uh, lose their logic and reason, their hand-eye coordination is dulled, and the sense of responsibility seems to go right out the window. And I lived through this. In high school with my friends, I watched it happen, and many times this deadly mix was deadly. I lost friends, I lost family members, 
I have friends who walk with prosthetics today because of drunken accidents. And there's a lot of losses caused in my life because of this. So today's message is called a deadly mix because in the prophecy, Revelation uses an analogy for people who are spiritually dulled in their senses as drunkenness. They use this very, very real definition to apply to what it's like spiritually at the end of days. And I believe Christians are spiritually dulled today. They're not keeping the pure faith. Every one of us is probably guilty of letting some form of battle on kind of still working in our lives. Bible prophecy declares that Rome and its laws have led many to spiritual drunkenness and confusion. And this type of spiritual mixing, the Bible calls an abomination of desolation. And that is a big term for most people. And I don't want to deal with the entire concept of the abomination of desolation, but I want to give you a few examples of what it really is and how it has happened before, how it will happen again. And it occurs whenever a nation or a kingdom opposes God and creates laws that stands against him, yet claim they're for Jesus. So it's looking like one thing, but being another. Just like that mixed drink. It looks like a a fruity cocktail, but there's poison inside. When it comes to God's sanctuary, his temple, his dwelling place, anything which is holy... The Bible says it should never be mixed with that which is profane, idolatrous, or common. Amen? Psalm 77, 13 says God's way is in the sanctuary. What does that mean exactly? God's way is in the sanctuary. Well, it means God placed his way of doing things in the sanctuary as an example to us so we know how to overcome sin. That's the whole point of God's way. Jesus is the way. If we follow that example... We will overcome sin, he will purify us, and he will make us perfect. Amen? Now, Satan has found a way to get people to believe him, and he has found a way for those who are willing to mix holy things with error to gain from doing so. Many people are willing to receive a price for doing the wrong thing. Well, Satan's always looking to find a price to make a mess of what God has called holy. Now, when mixing the law of God with the law of man, we are told that millions went to their death during the dark ages. Turn with me to Revelation 17 and verse 5. Revelation 17, 5. talking about this Babylon. And on her forehead a name was written, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother mother of harlots and of the abominations of the earth. So there is a mother of harlots, but it's also a mother of abominations. This is the parent company of those who mix truth and error. Verse 6, I saw the woman, what? Drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I marveled with great amazement. Verse 14, please. These will make war with the lamb and the lamb will overcome them. For he is Lord of lords and king of kings. And those who are with him are called chosen, are called chosen and faithful. So the Lord is going to take care of this drunken mess, of this spiritual mixing. They are going to make war against the Lamb and against the followers of the Lamb. But when Christ returns, he's going to set this aside. He's going to fix the problem. But as we mentioned in Sabbath school, it's too big for us alone. We have to rely on the Lord to fix these kind of problems for us. Jesus Christ himself is returning And for those who, for the purpose of gain, have followed their own appetites and mixed what was holy with that which was common, this abomination will be followed with a desolation. 
Every abomination that takes place, every mixing of what is holy with what is unholy is followed by a desolation. That's all the term means, the abomination of desolation. It means something holy was mixed with something unholy, and God says, I'm going to have a retribution when this takes place. So now that we've defined the term, the Bible identifies very specific times throughout history where this abominable mixing will occur. And when God's people commit the mixing and this desolation follows, it was important enough for for Jeremiah to write about it. So please go to Jeremiah chapter 44. Let's just read Jeremiah's account of this concept called the abomination of desolation. We hardly ever go into this much detail about the abomination of desolation during evangelistic series. So we're going to go a little bit deep on this topic today. Jeremiah 44, 19, when you get there, say amen. Jeremiah is going to be just before Lamentations. Okay. So the Bible says in Jeremiah 44, 19, The woman also said, And when we burned incense to the queen of heaven and poured out drink offerings to her, did we make cakes for her to worship her and pour out drink offerings to her without her husband's permission? Then Jeremiah spoke to all the people, the men, the women, all the people who had given him that answer, saying, The incense that you burned in the cities of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem, you and your fathers, your kings and your princes and the people of the land, did not the Lord remember them and did not come into his mind? So the Lord could no longer bear it because of the evil of your doings and because of the abominations which you committed. Therefore, your land is a what? A desolation, an astonishment, a curse. And without an inhabitant as it is this day. So the Lord is saying when sin is committed, the sin that you committed, there's going to be a desolation. The land is going to be made desolate. We prayed this morning about harvest for some blueberries. We prayed for, for the farmer's fields. When our land is desolate, what do we have, folks? This is serious business to the Lord. Abominations is the ultimate response against the Lord of heaven. So this concept, you would think, is, is mentioned by Jesus, of course. And he mentions this in Matthew chapter 24 and verse 15. Matthew chapter 24 and verse 15. Turn there with me. And you know this, you know this verse... But we're going to read it quickly and then move into the details behind it. Matthew 24, 15. Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel, the prophet, standing in the holy place, whoever reads, let him understand. Now, Jesus is basically just directing people back to the book of Daniel. He's not trying to give a dissertation on what the abomination of desolation is. He's just saying, It's in the book of Daniel. All the details you need to know. God's people will be reading prophecy at the end of time. Amen? That's what we're here for. Now, Mark 13, 14 is recorded the same concept in this way. So let's flip over to Mark really fast. We're going to look at three scriptures in the Bible, in the gospel, about this topic. So Mark 13, 14. And it says, so when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing where it ought not, let the reader understand that then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. So there's a little bit more detail here. Someone's standing where they shouldn't be standing. A little bit more detail. We see a little bit of repeat and enlarge even on this topic here. From Matthew to Mark, we see a little bit more definition about someone is standing where it ought not stand. When God's holy space is violated, that's a sign that people need to leave town. (laughs) 
Get out of Judea was the message here. One more, Luke 21, 20. Real quickly, just get an overview of what the gospel says about this topic. Luke 21, 20. And we get one final piece of information about this abomination of desolation. Luke 21, 20 says, But when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then you know that its desolation is near. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let those who are in the midst of her depart. And let not those who are in the country enter her. For these are the days of vengeance that all things which are written may be fulfilled. So now we have another detail. There's someone standing where they shouldn't be standing. There is a holy thing that was mixed with an unholy thing. And the notice to the people is when you see the army surrounding Jerusalem, this is your sign. So we see some details around this. Now, we know that Jerusalem was surrounded by the Roman armies, God's holy city at that time, right? Jerusalem was considered a holy place. There was surrounding areas. All the land around Jerusalem was considered holy. And when the armies positioned themselves around Jerusalem, they were standing on what God deemed holy ground. They were standing where they ought not stand. And of course, the desolation did follow. Jerusalem and the temple were destroyed. I want to read something to you from the great controversy on this. It says, Jesus declared to the listening disciples the judgments that were to fall upon apostate Israel, and especially the retributive vengeance that would come upon them for their rejection and crucifixion of the Messiah. This is the great controversy, page 25. Unmistakable signs would precede the awful climax. The dreaded hour would come suddenly and swiftly when the idolatrous standards of the Romans should be set up in the holy ground. Very interesting. Which extends some furlongs outside the city walls. Then the followers of Christ were to find safety in flight. When the warning signs should be seen, and this is important, those who would escape must make no delay. Throughout the land of Judea, as well as in Jerusalem itself, the signal for the flight must be immediately obeyed. He, whose chance, he who chanced to be upon the housetop must not go down into the house, even to save his utmost valuable treasures. Those who are working in the fields or the vineyards must not take time to return for the outer garment laid aside while they should be toiling in the heat of the day. They must not hesitate a moment, lest they be involved in the general destruction." So the great controversy gives us the importance of hearing and seeing the sign and making no hesitation to leave the city. This is an example that helps us understand what we need to be ready for in the abomination of desolation that's going to happen in our time, which we will get into detail. But the warning is coming, the desolation is prophesied, and there won't be time to get out. Now, Jerusalem was destroyed. They, they were partnering with Rome. Jerusalem was working deals behind the scenes with Rome. They were getting power. They were getting luxuries from Rome, mostly the, the Sanhedrin and the, and the Pharisees. But Revelation, Daniel, all the prophetic books tell us that Rome is a cruel beast. By the leadership of, of Israel partnering with Rome, the cruel beast, the fourth beast of, Revelation, of Daniel 2 and, and Daniel 7, this fourth beast power, they were committing the abomination. And the desolation that followed was that Israel was, was dismantled. They were destroyed. The temple was destroyed. Many instances... I wonder if I'm standing where I ought not to be standing. I try and be very careful with my life, decisions, where I go, what I spend my time on. 
And uh, we decided to go down to the fireworks. My mother-in-law and my wife's sister was here. And we went down to the fireworks. And um, there were a lot of people and a lot of substances, let's say. <laughs> it was pretty obvious. And I started noticing people bringing these big boxes in, these large boxes. And of course, they were fireworks, their own personal fireworks. And people were lighting them off, and I'm not sure how qualified they were to be lighting off fireworks, because there were fireworks going off as soon as they lit them, big explosions right on the ground. I saw things flying over my head, and I started wondering, maybe I'm standing in the wrong place tonight. But there was a lot of people there and I just started thinking about what do we need to do? I started a conversation with a couple of guys, met this man named Darius, um, talked to him for a while. He pointed out where his family was and that they were just here having a good time and that uh, he uh, had welcomed me to the Saginaw area. I said, I'm glad you could be here. He goes, these are good fireworks, you know. And he told me where he works, and we set up an appointment to meet afterwards. And I thought, praise the Lord, we can go into a place where maybe it's not so safe, <laughs> but there's souls there. There's people that Jesus died for there. And I'm going to be praying for Darius before I meet with him. But I met several people that night, and it's always a confirmation that there are people in various places everywhere we go who are looking for a kind word, who are looking for someone who can tell them about our Savior. Whether, they know, whether they're verbally asking for it or not, we know that's what they're looking for. And even though we live in a dark world, we have to be careful about where we're standing. And we're standing at a place maybe where we ought not that at least we're administering the gospel to people. The signs are clear that another abomination is near complete. This abomination that Jesus was referring to, of course, was in 70 AD. And uh, many heeded the warning quickly, and it meant the difference between getting out alive or dying. Many people didn't make it because they did hesitate. And friends, the Lord is giving us this example because he doesn't want us to be hesitant when it comes to getting out and being ready. So I want to talk about what happens in our day. The beast power that's stepping up right now is going to be making laws if they're not already making them annually in the governor's houses at Capitol Hill. Laws that oppose God. I believe Rome is surrounding us. Our lawmaking bodies are surrounding us. But remember what Jesus said in Revelation 17. He's going to come and put a stop to all of it. Now, I want to talk about when church and state united. Because this was one of the abominations that's mentioned. Church and state merged around 500 A.D., the Gentile nations were worshiping the sun for the most part. And as a society, they were violating every commandment of the Ten Commandments. God's church was never to be mixed with such a secular state. But in 508 AD, under the command of Clovis, Clovis was a general. And under the command of Clovis, Catholicism was established as the only state-sanctioned form of Christianity in Europe. Bible-based Christianity was uprooted through military elimination. Which brings us to our scripture reading. Because that moment there in 508, when Clovis gave his army over to the authority of the bishops, the acceptance of military power from the Gentiles was the abomination that would be taking place, that would be set up, and would still be happening in our day. So it's extremely important to know the history behind this. Our scripture reading, go to, our, go to Daniel chapter 12 and verse 9. Daniel 12, 9. And as Stacy read for us in our scripture reading, 
It says, and go your way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed till the time of the end. Many shall be purified, made white, and refined. But the wicked shall do wickedly. And none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. And from time, excuse me, and from the time that the daily sacrifice is taken away and the abomination of desolation is set up, there shall be 1,290 days. Now we talk about the 1,260 all the time, but we almost never speak of the 1,290. So I want to talk about this a little bit because it is in fact this time period that began in 508. Now, when did the 1260 begin? What was the date? Ended in 1798, 1260 years earlier, 538. So 30 years longer than the 1260 year period. But this 1290 was the precursor to the 1260 years. So let's take a look. Um, this can be somewhat of a technical section of prophecy, but I think if we take it and break it down slowly, you'll see what I'm talking about. And the final abomination of desolation that will take place, the desolation will be in our day. So you'll see that from Scripture as we move through this. But the time prophecy of 1290 day pinpoints when the mixing of the church with state power would begin. And that was in 508 under the leadership of Clovis and the bishops of Rome. So the unholy Gentile state was mixed with God's holy church, and we know that the way of Rome is wicked. Everybody knew the way of Rome was wicked, but, but they were trying to keep it together. And they were going to use the church to try and do it, continue to, to, to keep merging it together. Now, Can Rome be legitimized by just putting a church stamp on top of it? Of course they cannot. It's just like that mixed drink. It, it may look like a church structure, but it's still poison. It's still evil. It's still wicked underneath the surface of it all. From 508 to 1798 was exactly 1290 years. The, the taking of the Pope captive ended the 1290 just as it ended the 1260 because the 1290 started 30 years earlier. But the state sanctioned form of worship, what it did was turn people away from looking at the work Jesus was doing in the heavenly sanctuary and directed people's eyes to what was happening with the Pope and the bishops. That's an abomination to take people's eyes deliberately off of Jesus, bring it into the state religion for the purpose of power and control. So this is the abomination, another abomination that was going to take place at this time frame that prophecy writes about. But all the alternative forms of, of Christian faith had been eliminated. The Bible was illegal. Clovis's army uh, killed freedom of religion, and anyone who opposed the Church of Rome was eventually killed. And this was the case in Europe for this whole 1290-year period until the state, church-state power was broken. Now, Revelation 17 also describes the wealth and the luxury that was attained through the unholy merger. We've read in Revelation 18 that she was, she was loaded with pearls, Revelation 17, she was loaded with pearls and diamonds and stones. And she was working with the merchants of the world to get luxuries. So how did this military takeover be accomplished? Well, Clovis was in fact the first Catholic prince. And he came into power in 508. And that very year, he placed his army in the command of the Roman bishops. The organized Christian church at that day accepted secular military might of the French army. Now, does God's church need secular, secular ministry, military power? We don't need armies for God's church, do we? You see, their motives were all wrong. But they wanted that power, they wanted that wealth. Now, Clovis defeated uh, the Visigoths in 508 AD with this army. And of course, you will know the Visigoths. They're one of those three horns that Rome broke into that would be uprooted because they would oppose the papacy. So in defeating the Visigoths, he, he be, created what became known as the Merovingian dynasty. That term has been made popular lately by a few movies. But the Merovingian dynasty 
was created. And of course, it was because these ten, these three horns of the ten were uprooted. And the church, church state of the papacy was the undisputed power behind the throne in Europe. Now, the Merovingian dynasty had allowed the Church of Rome to profane the heavenly sanctuary by putting in and installing a replacement earthly sanctuary. Now, the earthly sanctuary had been done away with at the cross, but they saw a way to manipulate people with it. So they put in a confession and a forgiveness now had to be go through a priest. It was no longer directed at Jesus Christ in the heavenly sanctuary. The need for a resurrection was replaced by the theory of the immortal soul. You don't need a resurrection. You're already going to heaven or hell when you die. The Sabbath was replaced by the first day of worship because they worshiped the sun. And holy days became holidays, many of which we still celebrate today. So the abomination continues in our day. So in setting up a counterfeit sanctuary, Catholicism fulfilled the prophecy in Daniel 12. It set up an abomination that made the sanctuary desolate. God's way was replaced with the way that could not save anybody. And that is an abomination, my friends. And the Lord will not stand for it. There will be a desolation to follow it. Let's go to Revelation 18. Revelation 18. Revelation 18 and verse 19. Sounds like everybody's there. They threw dust on their heads and cried out, weeping and wailing and saying, Alas, alas, that great city in which all who had ships on the sea became rich by her wealth. For in one hour she is made, and what's that word? Desolate. So this judgment will come swiftly. This desolation that's long been long building over the over the 1290 years. It's building to this climax, and she is going to be made desolate in one hour. And the desolation will be on those who, who support. Babylon. If people are part of Babylon, they're part of perpetrating the abomination. Now, how many, how many lands will be affected by this desolation? Well, all you have to do is think about how far reaching the Catholic Church is. They've reached out to almost every land. So the desolation of the land will be huge. And anybody who is connected with it will be, in fact, taken down with it. Now, Revelation 18, of course, you know the scripture. It says, come out of her, my people, lest you share in her plagues. The final desolation is going to be done with seven last plagues. God gave us the three angels' message today, friends, to warn us that the desolation for this deadly spiritual mixed drink is about to take place. A desolation that the world has never seen before. God's vengeance, his retribution, his righteous requirement of the law is going to be carried out. And each one of us needs to be studying the pure word of God ourselves. We cannot allow the world view to be mixed in with what we believe. And we all spend enough time online. We're always getting input. Facebook, Instagram, whatever, whatever you spend your time on billboards. It's hard to eliminate all of it. But friends, we have to be clinging to the scripture like never before if we're going to allow ourselves to be that pure people that Jesus is looking for. Have you perfectly studied the prophecies? I wanted to go a little bit more in depth today on the abomination of desolation because I think it's noteworthy I think it's pertinent to what's happening today, and I think we need to be ready. Because when the sign comes, we won't be able to hesitate either. 1 Timothy 4.12 says, Let no one despise your youth, but be an example 
to the believers in word, in conduct, in love, in spirit, in faith, in purity. Those trusting in God's way will not be swept up by the general destruction because they will have become pure. They will not be deceived. They will not have mixed what is holy with what is unholy. Now maybe you've been busy. Maybe you haven't spent as much time in in reviewing the prophecy. I recommend reading the great controversy. Maybe once every year. It does that much for me to revitalize and remind me of where we really are. Maybe you've been busy, maybe you've been financially strapped and you haven't had time to think about the prophecy that's unfolding all around us. But friends, it's real. It's here. It's before us. It will happen the way God said it was going to happen. We need to take a serious inventory of how prepared we really are, prepared we are for the great judgment that's coming. And the great controversy has been going on for a long time. God says he's going to smash the image. It's going to come to a close. So today, Lord, I want to plead with the Lord, with all of you, that he would fulfill the righteous requirement of his unadulterated law in us. Each one of us can be an example to the believers that his holy ways are the best and the only way, and it doesn't need any mixing. Amen? So if you want to reject Babylon and only adopt your life around the pure principles of God, just raise your hand, friends. Amen.